Our text for this morning is from the book of Romans, chapter 8, beginning with verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Today, the Sunday nearest Earth Day has been designated the Festival of God's Creation Sunday on the United Methodist liturgical calendar. And I've chosen for today a reading from the eighth chapter of the Book of Romans. Now, Romans 8 is a particularly rich passage of Scripture. It is jam-packed with profound insights and, and familiar texts. Romans 8 is where we find the beloved verse which says, In all things God works for the good of those who love Him, who have been called according to His purpose. That's verse 28. It's also the chapter where Paul declares that neither death nor life, not angels nor demons, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the part of Romans 8 which was read a moment before is not as well known yet is just as powerful. In fact, it's among the most thought-provoking texts I think in all scripture. For in these verses Paul outlines a breathtaking vision of God's plan to redeem all creation. And he uses the image of three groans to talk about our yearning, our hope, and God's promise. In verse 22 he says, the whole creation has been groaning. In verse 23 he says, he says we ourselves groan inwardly. And in verse 26 he says, the Spirit of God also intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now in most translation you'll find the word groan in these verses, in those three places. A few will use the word sigh, um, but in our NIV it has the, it shows that it's the same root word for each of those three verses. But there are different kinds of groans, of course, in our lives. Uh, we will utter different groans depending upon the, the circumstance. There's the groan that comes from us when we hear a bad joke, you know, one that's almost funny, and we just kind of groan just to acknowledge that our friend said something that might have been funny. Then there's the kind of groan that comes from within us when we have a tough day ahead. Uh, maybe we know there's going to be a difficult meeting with a confrontation in it, or we have to fire someone and you let out a groan as you dread that day that stretches before you. But there's a third kind of groan, one that proceeds from the heart, a groan of yearning of he for healing or for deliverance or for the fulfillment of some long-deferred dream. That, I think, is the sense Paul uses the word groan here. And it's interesting that in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, uh, which preceded the time of Christ, called the Septuagint, that translation uses the same Greek word Paul uses here in Exodus. Exodus 2, 23, when it says the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out. And also Exodus 6, 5, when God says to Moses, I have heard the groaning of the Israelites whom the Egyptians are enslaving. So the idea here is that of a yearning, a longing, a, a craving to be delivered from some kind of bondage. That's the sense of these three groans in Romans 8. 
Well, I'm going to take them out of order. First, let's look at the groan that comes from within us. In verse 23, Paul says, We ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption, the redemption of our bodies. We groan. And our groaning arises from the gap that we know exists, if we have any spiritual sensitivity at all, between what we are and what we were meant to be. Here, of course, we are facing the issue of human sinfulness or human depravity, the doctrine of original sin, the stubborn hanging on of the darkness within us. A few years back, I taught a course on American church history at local seminary, and it's pretty standard in such histories to have a theme that during the late 19th century, theology began to get more and more optimistic about human nature. That was the age of progress. Amazing inventions, electricity, the telegraph, the telephone, flight, and so much more. Those technological advances, coupled with the popularity of evolutionary thought, prompted people to begin believing that human society, even human nature, was improving, moving perhaps even to a point of perfectibility. When World War I was called the war to end all wars, many actually believed that. But the subsequent horrors of that war and so much more which followed in the 20th century burst that optimistic bubble and saw the rise of what's often called neo-Orthodox theology, which rediscovered the doctrine of original sin. That there's something dark and deep in our humanity which, which stubbornly persists and will not be overcome apart from God's grace. Well, I think Paul speaks about this on the individual level in the previous chapter of Romans, in chapter 7, when he says, I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do I do not do, but what I hate I do. I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. I have the desire to do what is good, but cannot carry it out. I find this law at work, Paul says. Though I want to do good, evil is right there with me. In my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me waging war against the law of my mind. Well, in practical terms, how does that play out for us? Well, I think it means that even in our best moments, we are beset with perennially mixed motives. Even when we want to do what's right or just or true, we find that dark law, Paul mentions, at work, pulling us towards sin. And I find that I yearn, I groan for that day when I can act purely out of love of God, and not with an eye towards self-interest or applause. When I can trust God without anxiety, being entirely self-forgetful and unworried. There is a perfectibility which is possible, but it's only one which can come by God's grace working in us to remove those mixed motives and to heal us of our pride and our selfishness. That's what Father John Wesley meant when he spoke about going on to perfection the perfect love of God and neighbor. And the good news is that Christ died to set us free, not just from the penalty of sin, but also from its bondage, to set us free to be what God intends us to be. And so Paul can say in Philippians chapter 1 that he is confident that the one who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. I believe that, but I'm not there yet. So I groan, I sigh for that day. Well, there's another groan in our text. It comes not from humans, but from the creation itself. In verse 22, Paul says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. Now sometimes our vision of God's salvation is too limited, too individualistic. We tend to think of heaven or eternal life is sort of me and God on a cloud somewhere. But here, all of creation is encompassed within the embrace of God's redemptive plan. And for Paul, creation, probably primarily he's thinking of the earth. And Paul describes this creation as subjected to frustration in verse 20, or in bondage to decay in verse 21. The idea is that just as the ancient Israelites were in bondage to Egypt and groaned to be delivered, 
Just as we find ourselves in bondage to sinful patterns of thinking and acting and, and grown to be set free, so too the earth itself is in a kind of bondage. It's stuck in patterns of death and decay and groans to be set at liberty, Paul says. There's a theme that we do find in Scripture that all creation has somehow been thrown out of whack because of the introduction of evil and sin. Perhaps Paul has in mind Genesis chapter 3, verse 17. After the first sin, when God says, Cursed is the ground, which could also be translated land or earth. Cursed is the earth because of you. You know, sometimes I think we can be awfully romantic and sentimental about, uh, quote, nature. We say we want to get in touch with nature, and that means for us hiking through a well-tended park guarded by park rangers. But if we were thrust out into a real jungle, chances are we wouldn't survive very long. Creation can be red in tooth and claw, as Tennyson once put it. We find that in nature, there is decay, there is death, there is ugliness and pain. It's part and parcel of this world. Perhaps you know the popular Anglican hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Here's some lines. All things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the Lord God made them all. And him goes on to speak about the flowers which open, the birds that sing, the tall trees, the meadows. All of that's true enough. But it's really not the whole picture, is it? Decades ago, Monty Python did a parody of that hymn. And some of the lyrics that they came up with go like this. All things dull and ugly, all creatures short and squat, all things rude and nasty, the Lord God made the lot. Each nasty little hornet each beastly little squid. Who made the spiky urchin? Who made the sharks? He did. Yeah, there's stunning beauty in creation. On a bright spring morning, when you walk out into the sunshine and it warms you, it almost drives you to praise in spite of yourself. And yet there's also, in that same creation, death and disaster, earthquake, fire, flood. There are lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. You see, Paul was not looking at creation through rose-colored glasses. He looked at all of it. He chose faith in spite of the, the darker side. He saw a marvelous and yet marred creation groaning to be set free, yearning to be healed. And he also saw, I think, our own misuse of that creation. Another reason that creation groans, another reason we have an Earth Day, is because of how we have treated this earth. You know, in the Bible, humanity is given a unique role, a unique authority over creation. In Genesis 1, right after the creation of man and woman in God's own image, a description, by the way, applied to no other part of the created order. But right after that, we read this, God blessed them, that is, the man and the woman, and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. And the old King James had it, have dominion over it. The text says that we've been given authority to rule over God's handiwork. And it's amazing to consider that when that was written some 3,000 years ago, it didn't seem like we had much power over the earth. People were a whole lot more at the mercy of the elements and the animals than we are today. But in the last few centuries, we've come to possess enormous power over creation. Our technologies have enabled us to tame rivers, cut through continents, alter weather patterns, even tapped into the power of the atom itself. And you know, no small part of what made that possible was the influence of biblical faith. Because biblical faith de-divinized, you might say, the earth. Many peoples in the ancient world believed the earth itself was divine or, or part of God. But biblical faith, both Judaism and Christianity, said no. The earth is not God. It is the handiwork of God. The earth is not to be worshipped. It can be studied. It can be understood. It can be used for our benefit and for the common good. In many ways, this has been good. It's allowed for advances of all kinds that have so improved the quality of life but it's also had a downside. We've not only de-divinized the creation, 
we've also desacralized it. We no longer see it as a sacred trust and treat it with reverence. Instead, we abuse it, pollute it, regard it as disposable, and bury it beneath mountains of trash and toxic waste. And the earth itself groans under the weight of it all. Much good has happened in the last 50 years or so, I think, with the rise in our consciousness of the, of the need to conserve and protect our environment. And yet there are things that trouble me about the environmental movement. There are many who seem today as though they think biblical teaching, rather than human sinfulness, is the cause of our environmental abuse. And it seems that some are even sliding into what seems like uh, the worship of a divinized earth once again. But the answer is not to go back to Mother Earth worship. The answer is to embrace an attitude of stewardship, that we are entrusted with this creation. It doesn't belong to us. It belongs to God. And we hold it in trust both for God and for future generations. It means accepting that with that great authority and power God has given us, there is also great responsibility. And we are accountable for our stewardship for how we've used everything we're given, our time, our talents, our gifts, our monies, and the stuff of the earth which sustains us as well. Well, this leads to the third groan in our text, the most important one at all, and that's God's groan. God's yearning, God's striving and pining for us. In verse 26, Paul says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we, ought, what we even ought to pray for. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. I think there are two ways that people typically view God these days. One is simply as a concept, an idea, a principle, an impassive force that may explain the origin of things and somehow maybe keeps things together. But the second way is God as a passionate person. That's the biblical portrait. In Scripture, God is a passionate God, whom we may know in personal relationship. It's no coincidence that the suffering and death of Jesus is called his passion. He suffered for us, revealing a personal and a passionate God. And the cross tells us that God is passionate about our redemption, and about the redemption and recreation of all things in heaven and on earth. Even God groans sighs, yearns for us and all things to be made whole. And part of the good news is that what, God, what Christ began at the cross will eventually encompass the whole of creation. All creation is to be redeemed. Even death and decay will be no more. Now how can that be? How is it possible? I mean, it seems to us that death and decay are just so much a part of the, the system as we know it. Trees and plants, animals and people die. They become nourishment for new life. We can't imagine it working any other way. But is it possible that God can so redesign and recreate things that death is no longer part of the system? I don't understand it. But then I read this in Revelation 21. John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. Part of that promise is that all the visions of the prophets of a restored harmony in creation will come to pass. Like Isaiah, who looked toward a day when even the wolf and the lamb would sit down together in peace. Now, I admit I can't imagine that very well. But then I can't imagine very well people with no sin either. I can't imagine very well a kingdom of God which has no need for police or courts or even government itself. But is that not the promise? A new humanity, a new heavens, and a new earth, resurrection life, all things made new, and by God, for whom all things, even those I cannot imagine, all things are possible. And this is something that God's Spirit yearns 
groans to bring to pass. Well, here's a question for you. Do we yearn in that same way? Do we groan for these same things? And do we strive to see them fulfilled, however partially, even now? Philippians 2, 12 to 13 is a challenging verse. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. That verse to me speaks both of God's empowering grace and of our own commitment and involvement. One of the hallmarks of Wesleyan faith is that we are powerful moral agents. Our decisions matter. They have consequences that stretch into eternity even. And discipleship means actively engaging with all the means of grace at our disposal, seeking God's grace in Christ any way and every way we can, actively seeking to be good stewards of everything in our life, including the gift of the created order actively seeking to work with God to make things better. And as we do that, we become living signs to others of God's promise. We become beacons of hope. No, we will not fully fix the earth. Only God can do that, and on a day yet to come. But we are still called to be good stewards now. Just as we know, we will not be fully free of all temptation and sin in our lives until a day yet to come, when our redemption is complete, Yet, we are commanded to be holy now, even as God is holy. And in the midst of all of this, we are called, like Paul, to trust God, even with a sober-eyed view of just how messed up both our human nature and our world can be. But we're also invited to press our ears to the rails of eternity and listen for that threefold groan, the groan of creation, longing to be healed, the groan within ourselves, yearning to be whole, but most of all, to listen with wonder to the Spirit of God interceding for us with groans too deep for words. And having heard those groans, gain renewed strength to face the challenges of this present time and find renewed hope in a glorious future yet to be revealed. Amen.